Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today on our live session. My name is Matthew. Um, I am one of the uh, teaching staff for our online course, uh, courses on Coursera and uh, Udemy. Um, Alexander is uh, doing tech support behind the scenes as usual, and I will hand the session over to Professor Impey and we'll get started. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, it's good to have you all back in another live session for the online classes, and we'll just get started. Floor is open. The first question is from Aravind, who would like to know, uh, we placed detectors in underground mines to detect dark matter. Is that correct? Did we get any results? Um, yes, we did, and we have to be very patient is the answer. Um, we have... Uh, Astronomers, these are particle physicists for the most part by training the people who do these experiments because dark matter is assumed to be a particle physics issue in the sense that dark matter is most likely to be a subatomic fundamental particle as yet undetected in the lab. Um, and so to detect it, you use particle physics methods. And in particular, that means shielding your experiments from cosmic rays and other background radiation. So the preferred locations for the labs to detect dark matter are deep underground in mines um, to shield from contaminating particles because dark matter particles don't interact with a matter very easily. They don't interact with radiation at all. That's why they're dark. And so uh, these experiments are essentially looking for the dark matter particles colliding with a lattice of very pure semiconductor, for example, or a, an inert gas like Freon. Um, and, and giving some energy to the detector, which is then detected. That's what the dark matter detector is actually doing. And you need a huge volume or mass of detector material to, to see these very rare collisions with the dark matter particles. Um, so those are the, that's the general principle. There are a number of different manifestations of the experiment, maybe a dozen or more that are competitive. Uh, and most of them have been running not that long, a couple of years. There are a few that have been running four or five years. But dark matter is, although it's omnipresent and a big component of the universe, bigger than the normal particles we're made of by a factor of six, the, the weakness of its interactions with normal matter mean it's, it's a waiting game. You have to have a very large detector and take data for a long time to make a constraint that's meaningful for the type of particle that they're looking for. And I would say the experiments that are, have been going the longest and have the best sensitivity still have another three, two to three, maybe even four years to run before they either detect dark matter that, of the kind of particle they hypothesize or they rule out those particles. And if all the dark matter experiments that are underway come up dry or don't detect anything in the next few year, years, uh, cosmology and physics will be in a form of crisis because we won't have found the most plausible candidate for dark matter. Um, and the remaining candidates are either getting implausible or they don't solve the astronomy problems of dark matter. So it's going to be an interesting time. Uh, thank you very much. The next question is from Adele Burgess, who sent an email. Um, and uh, Adele would like to know if you could talk about the route to become a prospective astrobiologist. Um, there's not really a major of astrobiology, so what kind of uh, background do astrobiologists have? Right. Astrobiology is a very exciting field, of course. Um, it's very interdisciplinary, and the current generation of senior astrobiologists it came through it mostly through astronomy and some through biology or planetary science. So astrobiologists tend to have started in one of the cl classic disciplines of astronomy or related fields. Geophysics is another possibility. Um, and then they get interests in life and its connections with geology or with astronomy. Um, there are still very few astrobiology degree programs. There is, I think, only one or two PhD programs in astrobiology. Probably the most prominent, the one with the longest track record, is at the University of Washington in Seattle. I, I was on sabbatical there and I've reviewed that program. I know it very well and it's an excellent program. They also have a certificate program if you don't want to go all the way to a, a PhD. Uh, and then there are a couple of other programs elsewhere and I can't remember where they are. At the undergraduate level, it's actually just as rare because generally people are trained in a, either a life science or a physical science discipline 
and combining the life and the physical sciences as astrobiology does is actually very difficult at the undergraduate level. So I think there's literally one or of that order number of bachelor degree in astrobiology. So the recommended path is to study a core discipline like astronomy or planetary science or geophysics and layer in as many biology classes as you can if you're an undergraduate and then you have a chance to go to one of the p certificate or um, the f handful of degree programs in astrobiology as a graduate student and then you'll be very well prepared for the field. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Ali who's on with us, uh, sorry Ali who's on with us live. Uh, this may sound a little counterintuitive but if tardigrades or organisms like that can survive in outer space why don't we randomly send them out into outer space if we can't find life why don't we induce it well um there is at least one experiment where tardigrades were sent into there was one inadvertent sending of tardigrades uh, into space, uh, one adhering to the leg of a spacecraft, and then there was a space station experiment that involved uh, tardigrades. So tardigrades have been taken into the space environment to see how they do with um, zero gravity. You wouldn't expect to be a problem for a creature that small, but the question really is, can it handle the near vacuum or absolute vacuum of space and radiation environment? And a Russian spacecraft uh, showed that tardigrades could handle that environment at least for a time like weeks. So tardigrades can handle very extreme environments. They are extremophiles on the earth so they can handle extreme desiccation on the earth. Um, as for whether we could seed another environment with tardigrades, that's not clear. Um, it's not the moon, nearest object we could send them to, and probably not Mars on the surface because uh, the low pressure and the extreme aridity of the Martian environment I think is even too much for a tardigrade. Tardigrades do need some moisture occasionally. They cannot hibernate forever. So um, nobody's planned as far as I know to send tardigrades to Mars for example and then actually NASA has a policy that prohibits that because NASA's policy at the moment is not to do what's called forward contamination of any of its targets, not to carry living organisms there as a policy. Equally, NASA is worried about back contamination, not returning samples from Mars or anywhere else that might have organisms in them. All right, we have uh, several questions that are related. So Juan Carlos and Adele sent an email, um, and Juan Carlos is on with us live. There's been some very exciting and interesting news recently about the detection of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. Um, could you talk about that and um, give your thoughts on whether it's uh, bordering on sensationalism or um, how accurate some of these uh, news stories are about the claims about uh, life? Right. Um, oh, so I read one of the two papers just last night, actually. So I've, I've sort of caught up on this research a little bit. And yes, it's an exciting story. The, the back story is, of course, that uh, many planetary scientists feel that Venus has been unduly, ne unduly neglected as a potential target for looking for life in the solar system. Remember, it is a very close twin to the Earth. It's uh, within 10% of the mass and size of the Earth, hotter, of course. However, the speculation is that a few billion years ago, uh, Venus w was entirely habitable. And now the question is, is it uninhabitable because of its ex intense thick atmosphere, surface temperature of 700 degrees Fahrenheit, toxicity like sulfuric acid lacing the clouds and so on. Phosphine was detected um, in two different experiments at trace concentrations, but phosphine is an interesting uh, chemical. It's, uh, it's toxic, it's associated with uh, life, um, although the mechanism by which biology uses and produces phosphine is not completely known. And it's very hard to, to get phosphine produced without biology. And that's why the detection of phosphine, even in a trace amount in the Venusian atmosphere, has been taken to be indicative of life. So there is a range of opinion on this, this detection, of course. Um, many astronomers think that it's very hard to get phosphine any other way than biology. And so they say it should be considered a biomarker, an indication of biology. In, on the Venusian atmosphere, indirect indication. Some 
planetary scientists and some astrobiologists are more conservative and they say, well, you'd have to completely show that there's no abiotic or natural geological or chemical mechanism to produce phosphine uh, before jumping to the conclusion that it's biology. In other words, we haven't detected biology on Venus. We haven't even understood the pathway by which phosphine would be produced by biology on the Earth, let alone on Venus. Um, so I would say this discovery is exciting, but it's a few steps away from getting everyone thinking there's life on Venus. However, it's the culmination of a uh, campaign, I would say, by some planetary scientists going back 30 years to not neglect Venus so much and let's send some of our probes to Venus. Uh, NASA had a competition um, for planetary probes at the mid-scale range, the few hundred million dollar range, and there was a Venus uh, explorer, a Venus lander, the first Venus lander the Americans might have tried for almost half a century. They got down to the final four and then it was deselected. I think with the phosphine detection there's a good chance that NASA will kickstart an existing design for a Venusian lander, and so I wouldn't at all be surprised to see that uh, being put on NASA's manifest in the next year or so. The next question is from Ayush, who's on with us live. Um, how did we predict that the universe is 13.8 billion years old? Um, the prediction of the age is a direct output of the Big Bang model. So we have evidence, very good evidence, that the universe is expanding. That's the Hubble law, so that's 100 years old, that discovery. And we have a model, the Big Bang model, which predicts the properties, or, or rather accounts for the properties of the universe from a very hot, early, dense state. And if you know what the universe contains, then that model, which is executed within the context of general relativity as the background gravity theory, will tell you the age of the universe. So the age depends on our understanding of what the universe contains, and that at the moment is 4% normal matter, the kind we're made of, 24% dark matter, and the remainder and majority dark energy, indicated by accelerating expansion discovered uh, 25 years ago. So if those ingredients are measured wrong, or the, maybe the inference of those ingredients is wrong, then the age is wrong too. If you accept the measurement of those ingredients, then the measurement of the age within the model is quite accurate to a few percent. But you would like a cross-check on that age. You obviously, having measured an age or inferred an age from the model of 13.8 billion years, you would want to show that you never find any objects older than that in the universe. And we can measure the age of old stars independently of cosmology, and that, and that checks out. We've never found any stars or stellar populations older than about 12 or 13 billion years. So we get some confidence that the age isn't far off by the fact that we have an independent verification that the universe is at least 13 billion years old. Uh, the next question is from Swarnim, um, who would like to know, do the laws of quantum mechanics apply everywhere or anywhere in the universe? Uh, so, for example, are there is the Higgs boson all over, um, and are they you know, are we swimming through a sea of, of Higgs boson? Well, that's a good question because it gets to almost the heart of the scientific method. We we develop our theories uh, based on observation. Science, in my view, is an empirical subject, so it depends on data or observations. So our ideas of how microscopic particles work were developed in the 1920s and 1930s based on lab observations, based on how protons and neutrons and electrons behave, on the prediction of particles like neutrinos that were subsequently detected. So we have a pretty sturdy model of particle physics where the mechanics of how particles operate is called quantum mechanics. So does that theory apply everywhere in the universe? In as much as we've detected the same particles protons, neutrons, electrons, and neutrinos at distant locations in the universe, we might imagine, yes, that those particles across the universe are governed by the same physical laws that the particles in our labs are. But we don't actually have direct verification of that. So that is an assumption that we look to verify, but we don't always have a means of doing it because we can't go to a separate location and test our physics. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, just um, sidebar, sidebar. Can you hear the background noise? Maybe, um, maybe not. Oh, okay. Um, I, I'm hearing a little bit of it, but it's it's not distracting. I don't okay. believe. That's fine. 
All right, um, thank you very much. The next question is from one of our uh, live participants, CS appropriately, who would like to know, what are the most important contributions of computer science and algorithm design to astronomy these days? Computer science is uh, is a central field, and it, you know you're going to have to give me a break to go and try and get them to be quieter. Okay, we'll just take a little break. Sidebar. Two minutes. Okay, sorry everybody. We will uh, can pick up in just another moment. Um, thank you all for your patience. I appreciate that. We um, obviously have a few different um, noise environments that we have to deal with here. So um, again, thank you all for your patience. I appreciate it. Um, uh, again, for those of you who are just uh, joining us, um, we take questions from the chat and from our emails. So if you have any additional uh, questions, you'll feel free to put those in the chat. And we generally take them on a first come, first serve, but I also try and jump around quite a bit um, to uh, make sure that we get a variety of topics and a variety of uh, questions, and um, we try to keep them at a level appropriate for beginners. Okay. Um, so, do you remember where you were, or should nope. we re re the rewind question? the question? Okay. Uh, what are the most important contributions of computer science and algorithm design to astronomy these days? Um, I'd say computer science is, is central to astronomy now because astrophysics is a complex subject and so we use simulations of astrophysical set situations in, from anything from general relativity to hydrodynamics to the interiors of stars to gravitational wave generation and so on, black holes, you name it. It can be simulated in a computer. Uh, and so these tax computers in a number of ways. Probably the biggest contribution of, of computer science methods into astrophysics is, is parallel processing because that's both for the speed of calculation where parallel processing obviously increases the C's speed but also equally importantly in the coding. So astrophysical problems can be coded in such a way as to parallelize the code and make it much more efficient and run more quickly. Uh, and so for some computationally intensive calculations, like evolving an, an entire universe or a big chunk of it in a computer, these processes uh, are really central. They obviously have their uses in other fields in astrophysics, but they've become extremely useful in astrophysics. In fact, some astrophysicists have become uh, designers or partner designers in the chipsets that computers use to do fast graphics and fast calculation because their requirements are actually very similar to the requirements of gamers. All right, thank you very much. Um, the next question we have is from an email. Um, Irene uh, sent an email asking, is part of the reason we can't know what happened before or immediately after the Big Bang related to the, quote, collapse of the wave function seen with quantum mechanics? Um, can you talk about what that means, a collapsing wave function, and uh, how it's relevant? Um, hi, Irene. Just Irene's a good friend. So, um, interesting question, and I will separate it into two pieces. The issue of the collapsing wave function is a, is a fundamental issue of quantum mechanics because um, everything that we know about the microscopic world involves the things we observe being probabilities rather than certainties. And so everything from energy, momentum, time, uh, spin, every, everything we can measure has discrete values. And there's a probability distribution of those values. Now, when you observe an, an object, you get an outcome. Uh, it's neither, it can't be in between. It's either spin up or spin down. But in between the observations or before the observations, there's no fixed state. And so in quantum mechanics language, we collapse the wave function when we make an observation. We reduce all those spread out probabilities to one probability, the thing that we actually measure and observe. Now, does that situation pertain to the entire universe, early in the universe? Possibly. So there is a time in the universe, very soon after the Big Bang, when the universe was the size of an atom or had some atomic scales. And so quantum physics, as we understand it, should apply to the universe. The reason it's not clear that the wave function has meaning for the entire universe is that we don't actually have a theory that properly describes quantum effects back then because these temperatures and densities were so intense 
uh, that our theory fails us. So quantum mechanics, a well, very well tested and very well trusted theory for subatomic particles, essentially is beyond its realm of applicability when dealing with the very early universe. And so we're going to need some theoretical advances on the unification of gravity and particle physics before we can talk about that and, and answer that interesting question. All right, the next question is from Parth, who would like to know, is it true that the galaxies we are seeing today will soon vanish um, uh, from their place and we will no longer receive the light so that we can study them? Um, it is true that that will happen. Not soon, though. This is a process that's going to play out over hundreds of millions or even a few billion years. So what's going on, of course, is that the cosmic acceleration measured first in the mid-1990s and attributed to dark energy, something we don't really understand, but we do measure the acceleration, is carrying galaxies ever faster away from us. And at some point, you can pick any galaxy at a particular distance or redshift, and you can predict, given our knowledge of dark energy, how far in the future it will be before that piece of space-time is moving away from us faster than the speed of light. And at that point, the galaxy in the cosmological terminology, leaves our horizon and we stop being able to see it because its light can no longer reach us no matter how long we wait. And so there are galaxies we can see now whose ancient light we can see now which one day will stop being able to deliver us light because they're moving away from us faster than light speed. And you can calculate that for any galaxy. Now for galaxies near the edge of our vision with large telescopes, that may happen in, you know, 100 million years, a few hundred million years. For galaxies near us, of course, that are still accelerating, but accelerating from a much slower initial speed, it'll take longer for them to reach the speed of light. Uh, in an accelerating expansion, though, it happens, it still happens inevitably. And so the time is about two or three billion years before essentially all the galaxies we can observe nearby and far are ripped away from our view by the accelerating universe. All right, um, the next question, or you know, sort of series of questions uh, are from Hernan Reyes, who would like to know about uh, Enceladus, and um, would like to know how it is that um, Enceladus is warm enough um, to uh, keep uh, oceans uh, uh, of liquid water and then also, where does the energy come from that shoots the water up out of the crust uh, into space? Right. It, is a, it was a mystery, certainly, when Enceladus was first found to be making these uh, ice geysers out into space. Enceladus is a very small object, just a few hundred miles across. Um, and so it's too small to have a lot of natural internal heating from radioactive decay in rock. Would, that is a significant heat source in a planet like the Earth or, or even Mars or, or Venus. So Enceladus has very little heating of that kind. The only major extra heating source in Enceladus is tidal heating uh, from the parent moon of uh, Saturn. It is quite close to Saturn and on a fairly elliptical orbit, and the proximity, Saturn's large size relative to the moon's size, and the ellipticity of the orbit combined to make quite a lot of tidal heating for Enceladus. And it's considered, the models suggest, that that tidal heating is sufficient, plus the natural pressure of rock in the interior, to create small pockets of, of liquid water. By small, I mean hundreds of meters across, not many kilometers across. Um, and then it's because of the pressure of the rock that pressurized liquid water, kept warm by squeezing energy, essentially mechanical energy, will look for a way to escape. And it will find fissures in the rock and then jet off into space where it evaporates and turns into tiny ice crystals. This model sort of works. Now the diagnostic of where the heating and the evaporation and the escape is coming from are in what are called the tiger stripes of Enceladus. So if you look at thermal imaging maps of Enceladus taken in the near infrared, you see these uh, striped patterns at different parts of its surface. Those parts of the surface are hotter than adjacent parts, and they seem to be the place where the internal heat, and we also therefore think the water, is escaping. Um, but it's hard to model Enceladus because we really don't have a lot of detailed information of it. For instance, we don't know the, ge the geophysical nature of the rock that it's made of. 
uh, we just have very indirect measures of what Enceladus is made of. Uh, so we've had a couple of questions um, sort of related to this. Uh, one is um, if there are aliens looking um, at the Earth from far enough away, um, would they see dinosaurs on the surface of the Earth? Because uh, looking back, uh, you know, looking at uh, light from a long time ago is like looking at a time machine. Um, and I'll do, add the, the related question when you finish. Right. So the, that logic is is good. That if we imagine looking out, and you know, all the extrasolar planets that we found so far are in our own galaxy, and they tend to be in the nearest regions of our galaxy. So the most distant Earth-like planets we've seen so far are a distance of a, of a few thousand, maybe up to 10,000 light years. So we are indeed seeing those planets if we get light from them, if we were able, ever able to see their surfaces. That light is 10,000 years old. If you were going to ask how far away would an exoplanet have to be, or in the reverse experiment, someone observing us have to be to see us as the before the dinosaurs were extinguished, now you're talking about 65 million years, so you'd have to be 65 million light years away. And that corresponds roughly to the coma cluster of galaxies. So if there were, you know, intelligent civilizations on planets in the many galaxies of the coma cluster, there are thousands of galaxies, and so I'm sure by the simple math and the Copernican principle, there are trillions of Earth-like planets in that cluster of galaxies. If any one of them had sufficient technology to somehow know the Earth was a living planet and somehow diagnose what was happening on that planet, they would be looking at us as we were at the time the dinosaurs were extinguished. So as a thought experiment, it's correct. But as a practical experiment, I don't think it will work, even for very clever aliens with better technology than us. Uh, so then the other question that's related is, um, we can use stars in distant galaxies as lenses like gravitational lensing, but is there any way to use something like that uh, as a mirror uh, that would be allow us to see our own selves um, back in time? Yeah, that's an interesting thought. Um, in principle, if you had sufficient curvature or you could arrange it, you could have light doing a round trip and so acting like it was a mirror by going through a 180 degree deflection. So gravitationally, you can deflect light 180 degrees. That's essentially what happens near the event horizon of a black hole. At the event horizon, the light is completely trapped, but at a distance twice the Schwarzschild radius, you have actually a stable orbit of a photon where it doesn't go into the black hole and doesn't escape. So if somehow you could arrange a black hole to have light uh, pass by at the, at the photon sphere distance, then it would come back to us as if it were a mirror. Otherwise, having a natural mirror in space um, is a little unlikely because no surfaces in astronomy are completely flat and completely smooth. There are icy bodies in the solar system, and we would think elsewhere, that are highly reflective, that are they're almost like ice. Uh, but of course, they're round and rough, and they're not completely smooth and mirror-like. So as a thought experiment, again, it's a viable thought experiment, but it's just not clear how we would uh, naturally find any mirror-like object far away in the universe to do the experiment. Um, all right, the next question um, is from Lawrence, um, who would like to know some more information about the twin paradox. Uh, is it safe to say that the Earth twin observes time dilation and the astronaut twin observes length contraction? Um, well, they both, in a, relative, in a relative sense, will observe both. So the, um, the twin traveling at relativistic velocity away from the Earth, um, their clock will slow down as seen from the Earth. And so the, the stationary, the homebound twin, if you like, will watch their relativistically accelerated partner aging less. And that's the nature of the twin paradox, that if that twin then makes the return journey, also at relativistic speed, they will have aged substantially less than the twin that was homebound. The length contraction also exists as a phenomenon. So in principle, if the twin was accelerating at a significant fraction of the speed of light, they would appear to be compressed in the direction of motion. Uh, that's what the earthbound twin would see. 
the person who is traveling at that very high speed would seem to be their normal extent and their normal shape. They would see nothing strange going on. If they were to look back to their earthbound twin, they would observe that length contraction too. Um, so the relativity of it means that the effect is seen symmetrically in both directions. Um, the next question is from Atasam, who would like to know, um, as we are approaching a black hole, would our neural activity stop or slow down near a black hole? And you know, is that the cause of the time perception? Um, or is, uh, is that something different? That's an interesting question. Um, in the relativity of the situation, it is the actual chronology, the clock of time itself that is slowing down, uh, such that if you had a timekeeping piece or even an atomic clock, so a fundamental clock, it would slow down uh, as seen from a distant observer. And so, so we would therefore expect that a neurological clock, something associated with the frequency of brain synapses or processes, electrochemical processes in the brain, would follow the same clock. Since it's the fundamental time axis that's being distorted, then everything that follows that time axis, including brain chemistry, we would think would follow suit. All right, uh, thank you very much. The next question is, um, oh, sorry, I got lost in my list again. Um, can you talk about um, what's your opinion on how antimatter disappeared after the Big Bang? Um, is Did it disappear into some hidden dimension? Um, do we have any idea? The best guess is that the antimatter didn't disappear. It, it annihilated with the matter that at, at a very early stage in the universe, by which I mean uh, earlier than a nanosecond after the Big Bang, uh, there were essentially almost equal numbers of particles and antiparticles, of electrons and positrons, of neutrinos and antineutrinos, and of quarks and antiquarks, the fundamental constituents of our universe. Um, there was a very slight imbalance by about one part in a billion, in fact. And that imbalance emerges from a unified theory of physics that unites all the four forces except for gravity. And that's a work in progress, so we don't know the mechanism exactly that led to that asymmetry, but there are various ideas out there. Then, as the universe cooled, when there was no longer enough energy in pure radiation to create the quarks and antiquarks, the quarks and antiquarks that were already there would annihilate, and most of them would annihilate to create photons. And if there was a very tiny excess of quarks over antiquarks, there would be a few quarks left over. But all the antiquarks would go away. They'd have been turned into radiation by annihilation. And the same would be true of the electrons and positrons, the neutrinos and the antineutrinos, and so on. And so that's the schematic view of how you can end up with almost equal numbers of particles and antiparticles, but a very slight excess of particles where when the universe cooled, the particles and antiparticles almost all annihilate and so you have a lot of photons, and then a small residue of particles becomes the material universe that we see. All right, uh, the next question is from Varun, who sent in an email. Um, the question is um, about black holes. Um, that uh, You mentioned that black holes are everywhere, similar to black matter, or sorry, similar to dark matter or dark energy. Um, so how can you, but how can you hypothetically say that there are some, um, uh, some of these things that we can't see all around, um, you know, as, as sort of prominently as, um, as we think they are? I don't know that there are dark, uh, black holes everywhere. We, we know what makes black holes. The, the, die, the death of a massive star leaves behind a black hole, and we know how many massive stars are forming and dying. So we have a pretty good idea of how many black holes there are in our galaxy or any other galaxy. We also know that the centers of galaxies uh, create black holes. The black holes then grow over time as galaxies merge or as the galaxy centers have gas and dust that the black hole can consume to grow larger. Um, so in these senses, the number of black holes in the universe and their locations and their numbers are, are pretty well determined or understood. 
The only category of black hole where that's not the case are what are called primordial black holes, and these are speculated to be left over from the very early universe, from the Big Bang. And they're going to be tiny black holes, microscopic black holes. Uh, the very, very tiny ones would have evaporated by Hawking radiation before the present day, so we wouldn't see them. They'd have disappeared. But there's a small set of black holes, and they're in a region of a tiny fraction of a gram, uh, so bigger than a subatomic particle, smaller than a normal everyday object. Um, and those could exist. Those could persist uh, if they were created early in the universe, and they would be everywhere. They'd be all around us in significant numbers. They're very hard to detect, so detection of primordial black holes is an ongoing challenge. Astronomers have been quite clever at detecting, or rather not detecting them, and so have ruled out most of the windows of mass for primordial black holes. But there's one window left to observation that would accommodate a significant amount of dark matter in the form of black holes. And so people are trying hard to figure out how to, how to detect these or, or rule them out. All right, the next question is from Keith, uh, who's on with us live. Can you tell us anything further about the recent LIGO detection of a merger between a 23 solar mass black hole and another object of 2.6 solar masses? Uh, was it a neutron star? And generally, what have we learned from LIGO? Generally, this is a, that kind of a situation is indeed a neutron star black hole merger. So. Uh, the boundary between black holes and neutron stars is roughly three and a half times the mass of the sun. It's a difficult calculation, so it, nobody knows exactly what that number is. But this com smaller companion in that merger was presumably a neutron star. So LIGO is certainly able to detect the, the mergers of the most compact objects. And in, in decreasing order of strength of the signal from LIGO, assuming the same distance, the strongest signals come from black hole black hole mergers. The next strongest come from black hole neutron star mergers, and then weaker still from neutron star neutron star, because these go down in mass and the concentration of the mass, the density, also goes down, and so the gravity waves produced are weaker. Uh, and so that's the bread and butter of LIGO. And LIGO's current configuration seems to give it the sensitivity to detect one merger event of any kind roughly every week or maybe every two weeks. So LIGO should start to be seeing dozens of merger events per year, which is very exciting. All right. Uh, the next question is um, from Seamus, who would like to know, do you know if there are any other, are, are there any upcoming major astronomical observational events um, for conjunctions or, you know, eclipses or anything like that? Do you, are you familiar with anything that <clears throat> the students should be looking out for? Well, there's some nice planetary alignments with deep sky objects just right now, actually. So you need to look in your local newspaper or Sky and Telescope magazine has a good uh, summary of what's available in the month. Um, the, the most dominant, the prominent astronomical event, of course, in the upcoming period of time is the, uh, the solar eclipse that will go across the southern part of South America, Chile and Argentina, uh, late in November, I think. I can't remember the exact date. I was due to go on an eclipse cruise of South America. That got canceled, unfortunately, for obvious reasons. So I'm disappointed that I won't get to see that eclipse. But that's the next eclipse. Uh, there are other eclipses within the next couple of years, none that go through heavily populated areas. So eclipses are, of course, rare events, and uh, you have to move around the world if you want to catch them. Um, the next question is um, from Varun, who would like to know if we have observed um, anything recently in uh, CERN experiments um, you know, with ATLAS. Um, and specifically, he was interested in the splitting of um, muons uh, related to the Higgs boson particle. Right. So um, CERN's goal, you know, CERN has had some disappointments in the time since the Higgs. Remember, the Higgs was discovered in two seasons of observing there, 2012 and 2013. That's, you know, that's coming up on seven and eight, or eight years ago. So. People are wondering where is the next big discovery coming from CERN. CERN had hoped to see evidence of supersymmetry, which is an expectation from theoretical particle physics of unification. 
uh, where it happens at a much higher energy than CERN can produce in collisions, but there should be manifestations of symmetry, supersymmetry, and the particles predicted by it in CERN's experiments. And CERN hasn't seen that, and so some of the supersymmetry theories are actually starting to be ruled out by CERN's non-observation of that. So CERN, as the questioner implied, is falling back on the bread and butter of the Higgs particle. So having got a solid detection of the Higgs in the first season or two, uh, CERN is now trying to turn itself into a Higgs factory, if you like, where it can maximize the production rate of Higgs, and that means using rare channels like the muon channel the questioner was asking about um, and because that'll give us extra handles on the nature of the Higgs particle um, so apart from the mass of the particle which was detected right away in the in the initial uh, detection that gave rise to the Nobel Prize of a, between 120 and 130 giga electron volts there's really very little known about the Higgs boson and about the way it behaves so a whole set of secondary interactions and much rarer pathways to making the Higgs need to be observed to learn more about it. And that's what CERN is trying to do now. These are all needle in a haystack experiments. They're really hard to do. They take a lot of data. And after sifting between hundreds of millions of events, literally, you may find a handful of the kind you want. So this is long and tedious work, but that's what CERN was built for. Excellent. The next question is from Mukul, who's on with us live. Is the universe rotating kind of as a whole entity? Um, not that we know, and it would be hard to detect actually if it were, because we would be part of the rotation. So to detect rotation, you tend to need an external frame of reference to define the rotation. And if the whole entire universe was rotating, then what would that be like? Now, it depends on the nature of the rotation. Um, rotation that was uniform, that is to say, at the same angular speed at every distance, that will be very hard to detect. But of course, most natural astronomical objects don't rotate that way. They rotate differentially. And if the universe were rotating differentially, which is to say different amounts of rotation at different distances between astronomical objects, then we would have been able to detect that, and we haven't. So we can say that the universe is not rotating in that sense, which is the, maybe the most obvious way something would rotate in real physics. Um, there's also no part of the theory of the universe uh, creation and evolution, the Big Bang Theory, that would predict a uh, rotation of the entire entity, the entire space-time entity. So it's not really anticipated from the theory. The next question is from Katharina Basler, who sent an email. Um, we learned that after the Big Bang, the universe expanded faster than light. Uh, does this have any effect on how time passes or passed in, uh, you know, in the past? Um, well, it's yes, because the space-time continuum uh, is related through the equations of general relativity. And so the, the fact that we, in our everyday normal low-energy terrestrial world, see space and time as essentially orthogonal quantities. In other words, there's no interrelationship between space and time. You measure the position of something at a particular time, and then you can measure it at a different time. And the, and the measurement at a different time doesn't relate to the space of the object. And the space of the object doesn't relate to the time you measure it. Now, that's not true in cosmology. So, yes, in the fact the superluminal expansion of the universe does create, or the general relativity that describes it, has a coupling between the space-time axes. Uh, and so, in principle, it affects the timing of events that play out in regions of, of the universe that are beyond our horizon that we can't see. Of course, by definition, since they're beyond our horizon, we can't really diagnose them or figure out, figure out if this effect really happens. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from one of our live participants. Uh, Delzine would like to know, why is the shape of the Earth a geoid instead of a sphere? Well, the Earth um, is not directly spherical for a couple of reasons. The, the obvious one, of course, is that it's rotating. And so it has an equatorial bulge just caused from the fact that it's rotating. and there's angular momentum associated with that rotation and centrifugal force that pushes outwards on the bulge region. 
But the Earth is also deviating from purely spherical or symmetric situation because of the distribution of mass within it. It's mostly symmetric. Obviously, the core, the liquid core, will equalize and be pretty much pure sphere and isotropic in all directions. But the mantle material has significant variations in different directions. And obviously, at the level of the continental plates and continental masses, that's not completely uniformly or uni universally distributed smoothly. And so that all leads the Earth to have very slight deviations from spherical symmetry. Uh, the next question is from Jim Stunek, who's on with us live. Can you comment on the report of the Hubble and VLT showing what appear to be small-scale concentrations of dark matter producing lensing effects that are 10 times stronger than expected? Um, yes, there are some papers out there about um, on anomalous lensing events, um, and this is often relating to dwarf galaxies. So the galaxy category that we know the least about are, are dwarf galaxies. Now these are galaxies much smaller than, say, the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds, our two neighboring dwarf galaxies uh, nearest the Milky Way. Uh, nature, or the theories of hierarchical structure formation, predict a huge number of dwarf galaxies. Uh, the largest number of galaxies in the universe are dwarf galaxies. And what we know about them suggests that their dark matter concentrations or, com or components are very high. So these dwarf galaxies have a lot of dark matter, and lensing experiments are how we know their total mass, and also by comparing to how much visual light there is, what their dark matter fraction is. And it's some in these lensing experiments that some anomalies have turned up. But on it's not completely clear how to interpret these experiments because the theories of dwarf galaxy formation are still rudimentary, and so the theories are not very specific about how many dwarf galaxies there should be and what their, all their dark matter concentrations should be. So uh, it's an observationally and a theoretically uncertain situation. Uh, the next question is from Shiv Prasad, who is on with us live, who would like to um, know, when an object travels at a relativistic speed, time slows down um, as well as in a high gravity region. So is the time correction on GPS signals done due to high speed or because of uh, being further out in the gravity well? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it's a little bit of both, but, it, but the speed correction is bigger than the, uh, the mass correction, um, by I think by an order of magnitude. They're both relevant, though. You actually have to take both into account. Um, so the satellites are, are moving at very small fractions of the speed of light, but it's significant enough for the time dilation in the signals they send to be quite easily detectable. The, ma the time dilation due to gravity effect, the fact that the satellites are in Earth orbit as opposed to on the surface of the ground, is a much smaller effect. I think it's about one part in a trillion or one part in ten trillion, whereas the uh, the dilation due to motion is, is quite a lot larger. But they actually both have to be taken into, effect, into account. Um, uh, so we have another uh, question about Enceladus. And um, the question is, is there a reason that all the cracks on the surface are sort of parallel to each other facing the, the same direction? Um, or is that just a coincidence? Um, um, from their formation. Right. So that, that really, we don't know the answer to that. That's speculation. I've seen some planetary science blogs that sort of speculate about it. So what the question is of referring to are these tiger stripes on the surface are, are parallel striations uh, in groups. And, the question, and they're roughly aligned with each other. And the question is, why should that be the case? And the answer is, we really don't know, because we don't know what the for formation process of Enceladus is. Enceladus, for example, as a very small moon, may have formed from fragments of rock that coalesced while the rock was still molten. And so if Enceladus didn't fully melt when it formed, it wouldn't have homogenized itself to the point where everything would more or less be the same and there wouldn't be any preferred orientation of cracks or striations. So possibly these striations and their alignments indicate that Enceladus never fully melted when it formed and it perhaps formed from the accretion of some large planetesimals uh, in the region around Saturn. 
And so it's showing a little bit of a trace of its history of formation in these markings. Um, one of our live viewers, Ali, would like to know if, in general, we could be looking for life sort of incorrectly. Um, is it possible that it could exist as something like intelligent electromagnetic waves, or could the viruses on Earth be von Neumann probes? Um, absolutely. I mean, I like questions like that because it encourages us to remember that we really don't know much about life or biology at all. All we know is what happened on the Earth. All we know is our form of life. The only form of intelligence and technology we know is, the, is what we are capable of and have produced in the last few hundred years. What could life that's formed in a different location that's had longer, billions of years longer potentially, to evolve and become intelligent and develop technology, what could it have generated or produced? We have no idea. It's certainly conceivable that it could be miniaturized forms of life that have quite intense capabilities. In other words, the energy and information packing of normal biology is not the maximum that could be achieved, e even in a biological organism. Forget about going to computing. Um, and so you could imagine hypothetical life forms that are, are highly concentrated or high density compared to ours, faster metabolisms maybe. Uh, where their technology could play out on a very small scale, um, as in von Neumann probes on a virus scale, if you like. So that would be a very extreme version. Um, also, life could be on a, exist on a very large scale, a coherent scale that's larger than perhaps a planet uh, caused by network effects, um, and where maybe the speed of motion or interaction or signal communication is not what's important. Fred Hoyle famously speculated in his book, The Black Cloud, in the late 1950s, about life that formed from a chemical network within a dark cloud where stars would form. So does life even need a planet? Does life need water the way we assume it does? And the answer to these questions truly is that we don't know. So we go around and look for life more or less as we know it, because that's what we have and what we understand and what we know how to look for. Once you open the box wide, though, on biology, then the problem becomes you don't know what to look for. Uh, the next question is from one of our um, emails. JKY Athavan asks, how does neutrino oscillation occur, and how is it possible that neutrinos change its flavor or kind um, and apparently change the mass? Um, short answer, we don't know. This is, this is new physics. It's physics that's not part of the standard model. Um, in the pure, simplest early forms of the standard model of particle physics, neutrinos were massless and traveled at the speed of light. We do know, however, they have a slight mass. And all we've been able to do is observe in particular situations the fact that neutrinos can convert in flight from one form to another. Remember, there are three families of neutrinos with different masses. Um, all the we don't actually catch this act in the process of happening. So what neutrino experiments do is they're able to measure essentially the difference in the sum of the squares or the masses of the two flavors of neutrinos, but neither individual mass nor the ratio between them. So the experiments that have shown that neutrinos oscillate, change from one flavor to the other, don't actually pin down the mass of either flavor, unfortunately. And physicists are kind of struggling to design experiments where they can actually get an absolute handle on the mass of the neutrino, any of the flavors. Uh, the next question is from Maria Grant, who sent an email. Um, can black holes uh, go away? Could they implode and come apart? Or do they ever get smaller and collapse? The theory of Stephen Hawking says that black holes will all evaporate. Um, so they, of their own accord, they don't disappear, they don't change form, they're the last stable state of matter in the collapsed inner region of a massive star. Uh, but according to Hawking's theory, the black holes uh, have a temperature, and that temperature implies they're emitting radiation, and because mass equals mc squared, the equivalent is a mass loss, very slow mass loss, very feeble amount of radiation. Uh, so black holes are not eternal, according to Stephen Hawking's theory. Neither part of his theory, the, neither the Hawking radiation itself nor the fact that black holes lose mass, has been observed. And actually, they're at such a tiny level that there are no planned or current observations that could detect these effects. 
Um, speaking of Hawking radiation, uh, can you talk a little bit about how um, Hawking radiation works um, and how it is linked with black holes? So Hawking radiation is uh, the hypothesized thermal radiation of a black hole, where black holes were originally considered to only have a couple of properties. They had a mass, they had a size given by the event horizon, and they probably had a spin or an angular momentum. Now with Hawking's theory, they have a, a fourth property, which is temperature. Um, and the temperature implies they're a black body emitting very feeble amount of radiation uh, at equivalent temperatures of maybe a billionth of a Kelvin. The Hawking radiation emerges from the immediate vicinity of the event horizon, where when particle-antiparticle pairs are created, which arises spontaneously from the vacuum, there's a finite chance that one member of the pair will go into the black hole and the other will escape. Now since the energy that makes the particle-antiparticle pairs is extracted from the vacuum of space, that's a net that's a net extraction of energy in effect from the black hole itself when that radiation leaves. And so in the theory, that predicts that the black holes, by losing energy, are equivalently also losing mass. So it's the particle-antiparticle pair creation in a virtual manner at the event horizon that leads to the prediction of Hawking radiation. Um, the next question is, um, what effects do or might gravitational waves have on other massive stars, such as black holes um, or magnetars that are nearby to um, where a, an explosion or you know, event took place? A gravity waves themselves, gravitational waves, are, are extremely subtle uh, flexing of space-time. And so when gravitational waves, even near their point of origin, pass through another object, like a black hole or a neutron star nearby, or a person or a planet or a star, or anything, it's a very subtle effect. There's no obvious way that it would cause any change. It would even be hard to detect that at that close a distance. So it's basically assumed that when gravitational waves are created by a, a cataclysm, like a black hole collision, they flee the scene and with almost very little effect on anything nearby. Excellent. Um, the next question is from, um, there are several questions about um, other planets in the solar system. So uh, what are the chances that there could be another planet in the solar system? Um, either one that's um, affecting Mercury's orbit that it processes or, you know, something further out, um, you know, that is always there or something that swings close to um, the sun. So and this is generally called this category of uh, object, hypothetical object is called Planet Nine. Um, it's been hypothesized that there could be a hidden planet or a missing planet inside the orbit of Mercury or very close to the Sun. This has also been called Vulcan in the literature, this, this hypothetical planet. That kind of a massive object in missing or as yet undiscovered in the solar system close to the Sun is very unlikely. Uh, it's, a, it's really easy to rule out an object close to the Sun that's of any significant size. So I think that's not really a viable option anymore. But having a massive object in the periphery of the solar system, an outer massive planet called Planet Nine, say, um, is completely viable. And in fact, people, some planetary scientists, claim they've seen perturbations or alterations in the orbits of objects in the Kuiper belt that indicate such an object with the mass of four, five, or ten times Earth mass even uh, could easily exist. And some people have even speculated that it might be a black hole. That was a recent speculation that made, based on a few preprints that made the newspapers in the last week. Um, so we don't know. Astronomers are still looking. It's entirely possible during, in that vast real estate, sort of 40 to 80 astronomical units from the Earth and moving well away from the ecliptic because Kuiper Belt objects don't stick to the narrow band of the ecliptic. Um, there are big things and big things we haven't yet recovered, but those surveys are ongoing, so we'll know eventually. Um, all right, so we are almost out of time for today, so I will, um, there will be one more question that we will answer, and then we will be 
kind of out. Um, and then for the people of us uh, who have joined fairly recently, um, who are interested in the phosphine question on Venus, we did talk about that at the beginning of the session. So um, when we're done, feel free to go back and listen. It was probably about the third question um, that we covered. Uh, so the, the last question is, uh, can you talk about the ladder of life experiments and what would constitute success? I'm not quite sure what that refers to, the ladder of life. Um, if it's tree of life, I know, I, yeah, maybe I have to punt on that one because I'm not sure what the term refers to. I understand. That's, uh, I wasn't sure if you were familiar with it because I hadn't heard of anything like that. Um, and finally, um, uh, can you talk about the possibility of something like a methane-based form of life? Uh, what are the chances of that, and um, have we considered um, why that doesn't exist or um, how that could exist? There are people working on that. So um, methane and ethane, they're very closely related chemicals. We know that uh, Titan, for instance, has liquid ethane and methane lakes and oceans with a small amount of uh, water in there and and uh, and few and other chemicals like ammonia. So the question is, could you generate biochemistry with ethane and methane as a as a basis as opposed to just liquid water? And people have tried to do simulations in a computer about this, and they've tried with some difficulty, of course, to replicate these conditions in a lab. And I'd say the jury is out. I would say, for some uh, chemists, ethane and methane are promising ingredients for potentially building a biochemistry. But you need other trace ingredients too. You need nitrogen in the mix and that would presumably come from ammonia. Uh, you probably need uh, sulfur in the mix and if you ever want to get energy storing molecules like ATP then you need some potassium or phosphorus. So the very simplest, a handful of Chem chemicals in the periodic table are insufficient to generate complex biochemistry. And it's just not clear uh, if, in the absence of something strongly based on carbon and water, you can actually generate sufficient complexity. So you need carbon and you would have to store information in a macromolecule. And we think carbon-based carbon chains are the best way to do that. So carbon would probably have to play an assisting role in an ethane, methane-based biochemistry. But we don't know. People are still researching it. Very active and interesting area to study. Thanks for your questions. A lot of ground covered today, and that was great. And we'll announce our next two sessions and be back with you in a week or maybe two weeks. I'm not sure what our spacing is now.